Hello everyone, this is Dr. Kokte and I am going to talk about class three and class four composites today. I met you guys all um, in February. We did rubber dams together and um, I was so happy and thrilled to be with you guys. Um, actually, I have to share a story before we start class three and class four cavities. Is when I met you guys, I went back to my office and I have a coworker who works in UOP, um, the same program. Um, uh, she does the lab portion and she asked me how was my experience. And I told her that you guys were amazing, very hardworking. You guys did such a great job. I was very impressed with everyone. Uh, you guys um, were very, very good. So I wanted to tell you guys um, that um, I was very happy to be with you guys and I'm again very, very happy that uh, we can do this together. I know it's online. I hope you guys are all uh, safe and uh, taking care of uh, everything that needs to be done. Um, so let's talk about class three and class four composites today. So class three and class four composites are my favorite topic. The reason being, it's a piece of art. You're basically uh, doing an artwork on a patient's tooth. So what are class three cavities? Why does it happen and how do we fix it? So uh, as you see, uh, class threes are mostly on the proximal surfaces of interior teeth and they do not involve the incisor ledge. So if they involve the incisor ledge, we automatically change it into a class four cavity. So um, this is how a class three composite prep looks like. It's rectangular in shape. We normally uh, right there, what you see is like a base, like a vitro bond or something which has been placed. Um, and um, um, and here is a class four cavity. Now these are proxim they also involve proximal surfaces of interior teeth, and they normally they do involve the incisal edges. Um, in uh, this case, uh, there is a lot of decay, and a lot of decay has to be removed. The preparation for both class three and class four cavities is pretty simple. We normally remove whatever is the caries and we bevel and then we fill it because we are relying a lot on bonding agent in uh, class three and class four composite, uh, composites. So this is a class four composite restoration and um, basically it's involving a lot of incisal edge. And if you notice, there is a big bevel which is there. So in class four composites, we actually place a very strong bevels uh, so that aesthetically our composite can blend in better. Now we're going to talk a little bit about caries. Why does it happen? Uh, it happens because plaque accumulates below the contact area. It's, um, you know, uh, people are not flossing their teeth on regular basis. And that's when, uh, you know, uh, slow and steady uh, the food and plaque uh, changes it into cavity. Uh, people who are dry mouth, uh, who ha do open mouth, the mouth breathing, or who are on medications, you wouldn't believe when I tried to Google the medications which cause dry mouth, there were five pages or six pages of medications which cause dry mouth. Uh, basic medications like Claritin, which, you know, during allergy seasons, all of us take it. You know, those cause dry mouth. High blood pressure medications like etinol and all those are causing dry mouth. So, uh, you know, a lot of medications are, do cause dry mouth and people have to make sure that uh, they are sipping on water and things like that. So, you know, the mouth is not too dry. Acidic environment, uh, like um, intrinsic, which is caused by acid reflex. Extrinsic, 
like foods, like a lot of people love eating lemons and that could cause, um, you know, an acidic environment in the mouth, uh, breathing in acid uh, in dry cleaners and obviously poorer oral, poor oral, oral hygiene. Um, there is no doubt if you have poorer, poor oral hygiene, there will be a lot more plaque, uh, food, which will be all over and bacteria will basically cause lots of cavities. So um, we see a lot of cavities also in people sometimes who are good, who are good with oral hygiene. And it's uh, sometimes uh, their um, uh, genetic, genetics also plays a big role uh, in uh, causing caries. So it might be genetic or the kind of bacteria they have in their mouth, which could cause it. So now for the diagnosis of class three cavities, uh, normally when we look at the x-ray, we would see that on the radiograph, there is decay which is going to the DEJ uh, into the proximal surface and a little bit of dentine would be involved in it. And that's like automatically we are going to go ahead and do a class three cavity. Yeah. Do, when there is a class three cavity, we are not going to see any periapical radiolucency. It's just going to be decay, which would be shown on the x-ray. And um, a few times uh, clinically, we can see there is a color change on the marginal edge. It looks darker. It's like blackish gray in color. Um, and that might be a sign of um, caries. Now, a lot of times clinically, I have seen that, uh, you know, there is a black staining kind of thing in that area, proximal areas, but I don't see any radiographic decay. Patient has good oral hygiene. A lot of times I would just put a watch. Patient comes regularly. I would just watch it and just see if it's, just um, a stain or something else which is going on. And if there is something we notice after six, eight months, then we drill it. But I try not to drill till I'm 100% sure we need to drill. Um, now, a lot of times we have to decide whether we're gonna do facial or lingual approach for um, the cavity. Most of the time, we are gonna go lingually because it's more conservative than facial. A facial approach, you have to be very, very careful because uh, the moment you touch burr on the facial, you have to do a nice aesthetic job. In class three, when you go through the lingual, a lot of times you're not even coming on the facial surface. So it's way easier for you to do a filling. But in few cases, you know, if it's a lot facial cavity, you, you're gonna do a facial approach, but you have to be very careful how you angulate your bar. You have to be very careful about the shade selection. Um, and then a lot of times the teeth are rotated and when they are rotated, or overlap, it's, it's hard to do those fillings. So you have to, at that time, make a clinical judgment of whether you're gonna go uh, from the lingual or facial. And obviously where the decay is. Now, in certain cases, when the decay is just facial, there's no lingual involvement, you'll go facially. But try, most of the time, we try to do it through the lingual. So now we're going to talk about class three uh, preparations. Before I um, talk about more class three preparation, I wanted to show you a video of Dr. Richard uh, Stevenson. I think he uh, has a very nicely summarized video. And after that, we will go over um, all this, um, the alkaline form, resistance, retention, and finishing walls and margins. So let me try to put this YouTube video. I got it. 
So I'm going to play. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Richard Stevenson, and I'm the director of Stevenson Dental Solutions in San Dimas, California, where we have a teaching center that focuses on excellence, skills enhancement in the broad realm of restorative dentistry. We have many videos on YouTube, and I would welcome you to please give me feedback and let me know what I can do to make these videos better and to provide topics that are relevant to your clinical practice or whatever your pursuits may be. Today, we're gonna to discuss the class three composite preparation. And the class three is actually a very right? simple preparation, but a lot of people are confused. And I think that we can- So just look at the preparation. It is so rectangular. Spend a little bit of time during the video of- Sorry. Uh, we have many videos on YouTube and I would welcome you to please give me feedback and let me know what I can do to make these videos better and to provide topics that are relevant to your clinical practice or whatever your pursuits may be. Today, we're gonna to discuss the class three component. So I wanted to tell you guys, just look at the preparation, how rectangular it is, how it is not going to the facial, so it's easy to fill it and it has rounded um, uh, rounded angles. Uh, also see how the bevel is hardly there. So a lot of times, class three, the bevel is really very, like 0.5 millimeter. It's very small bevel we give around the tooth. And we, we don't go into an area where just for beveling, we want to go in that area. There is no cavity or anything. You just leave it alone if, uh, if there is nothing there. Positive preparation. And the class three is actually a very simple preparation, but a lot of people are confused. And I think that we can spend a little bit of time during the video of uh, demystifying some of the confusion. We're gonna be performing an ML on tooth number eight. And as we see the tooth from the lingual, we can see that it does not have a very broad contact incisal gingivally. It's a rather small contact area. And understanding where the contact area is and where the gingival embrasure is, is critical to understanding how to prepare this particular preparation properly. Let's take a look at the armamentaria. And it can't be simpler than the armamentaria here because we're gonna be using essentially one or two burrs, the 329 carbide, or we'll use the 330 carbide. So these two burrs are versatile for this particular preparation. I would suggest the 329 on the left if you wanna make a smaller prep. And the 10614 enamel hatchet, which will be used for refinement. Let's do a little prep planning before we get started on this simple preparation. It's sometimes helpful to take a pencil and mark exactly where the contact area is located because your preparation is not going to be located entirely in the contact area. Part of it will be gingival to the contact area and part of it will be in the contact area. After all, caries starts below the contact area and then migrates in towards the dentin and up and out towards the facial, towards the gingival, etc. So this is the contact area and that's not where you want the prep. The prep is gonna be decidedly more gingival than the contact area. So we may have a mark that about halfway through the contact would define the incisal wall and approximately two millimeters gingival to that would. So I wanted to tell you guys that watch uh, on how his uh, preparation is looking. He is... Um, Define the location of the gingival wall. It's halfway into the contact and halfway in the gingival embrasure. So, um, you know, it, it's a good idea for uh, you to kind of draw it, like how he has drawn if you are going to prep the, the tooth. Uh, that would be very helpful. Um, also uh, notice how uh, the outline form kind of follows along with the tooth. So you want to um, go exily along with the tooth. Sorry, sorry guys. Well, 
we're going to try to follow the curvature of the tooth. In other words, we're going to follow the DEJ on the axial wall and create more of a rectangular shape with rounded internal line angles when we're completed with the preparation. I think that you want to start your preparation near the bottom of the contact area and then extend your preparation incisally and gingivally. Let's look at this from the side view. And I want to be clear about this because a lot of people refer to the direction that you push the burr in this preparation as facial depth. In fact, it's not facial depth. It would be considered facial extension. So as we're extending the burr towards the midpoint of the tooth facial lingually, which is about two millimeters, maybe a little bit more than two millimeters, we're going to be pushing the burr facially. The only time we use the word depth in this particular preparation is to describe the axial depth. So let's take a look at how the burr is probably going to be directed in this particular prep towards the facial. In other words, your facial extension will go out in this direction, 90 degrees relative to the lingual wall in a facial direction, in other words, in a facial extension. If we were to superimpose the 330 burr here, which measures 1.5 millimeters in length, you can see that the burr is going to extend more than the length of the flutes. Now, you may refer to this as, I need to go deeper, but actually the proper terminology be, would be to say that you need to go more facial. So the preparation is rectangular. And remember, we're going to be performing this preparation entirely in, with indirect division in the mirror. So finger rests and... So that's very critical. You have to do the whole filling also, remember, in indirect division because it's an upper tooth. So that is something you will have to master. Secure chair position is really important. So when you see the preparation as we've drawn it on the tooth, a lot of the preparation is located gingival to the most gingival part of the contact area. After all, that's where the caries is going to be located. And when we start the preparation, let's try to put the burr in the middle of the prep, not only incisal gingivally, but mesial distally, so that we have a little bit of protection. You notice that the burr is being held 90 degrees relative to the lingual surface. And that would be visualized not only from the incisal view, but from the proximal view. So let's go ahead and get started. We've made the marks on the tooth, which are obviously not necessary clinically or even on a type of knot, but I've done it here for demonstration purposes. And we're going to start the preparation with a small punch cut right in the middle of that intended outline form. So let's take a look at how this gets started. you'll notice that I made a punch cut that was about 1.5 millimeters in depth towards the facial or your facial extension. And the burr is then going to be reinserted into this small initial hole and then extended incisally and gingivally, making sure to leave a small shell of tooth structure along the proximal to protect hitting the adjacent tooth. We don't have to worry about going too deep axially if we leave about a 0.3 millimeter little shell on the side. There's plenty of room for the burr to fit and for us not to hit the adjacent tooth. The key here is to keep the position 90 degrees relative to the lingual wall and make small little brush strokes to remove tooth structure. This preparation really doesn't take more than about two or three minutes to do. It's pretty simple. Let's take a look as I spend some time performing some of the extensions.
I think it was pretty clear in that little clip that we are really spinning the burr at a very low RPM in order to achieve extensions to the... Okay, so it turns out not all laptops are created equal, which is why it switched... ...the outline form. Refinement for the preparation is performed in a, with a combination of the 10614 enamel hatchet, which is an amazing instrument, particularly if it's sharp like this one. And we're going to use this in this direction and upside down in order to get the proper refinement. You'll see that we can use this instrument in this particular way to chop away undermined enamel. And so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take the instrument insert it into the prep and just click it over towards the proximal. You'll have no possibility of damaging the adjacent tooth with this particular method. And you're going to knock off that little shell, which is going to allow you to then insert the instrument perpendicular to that and remove any C shapes or any undermined lips of enamel by just pushing it in this direction. So we can push it in here, remove that little area up near the incisal proximal, and then we can slide down along the facial wall. We're not trying to make sharp internal line angles. In fact, we're making rounded line angles. And the reason we need to do that, of course, is because composite needs to be adapted to a round internal form. And you can see that when we use the instrument in one direction by starting at the facial and scraping it out or starting at the gingival and pushing it in and not going from two different directions, we'll never create a sharp line angle. We'll always keep that nice and rounded. You do want to be careful not to scrape tooth number nine. And it's usually pretty easy not to do that, but you want to be a little bit mindful of that as you're moving along. This instrument is one millimeter wide. So our preparation needs to be a little deeper than one millimeter in order for us to have the instrument fit easily. So we've just spent a few seconds really performing a little bit of refinement. Uh, there are still some rough areas, some extra little marks along the outline form that need to be extended. And we're gonna use the burr now for that very slowly, very carefully, just using it almost like it was a little sanding device that we're just gonna just feather strokes, little brush strokes, just to remove any little lips or irregular areas in the outline form. And this is where you need to take a lot of care to avoid hitting the adjacent tooth and avoid making a large preparation. So you can see at this point that it is nearly finished and it didn't take very long at all. We can use the hand instrument again just to remove any little lips down here. We don't want to have that angle, that cable surface angle, to be acute. We want to have it uh, 90 degrees or slightly obtuse so that the enamel rods are supported. When we take the tooth out of the type and look at it from the side, you can see that it is almost like a box on a class two, but it's dropping at uh, 90 degrees relative to a class two box. It's sort of horizontal and all the line angles should be rounded and clean. Do we need to put retention grooves? Well, there's a lot of controversy about that, but usually today, most schools are not teaching retention grooves, nor are they teaching cable surface bevels. Leaving a butt joint margin like this is very acceptable. This is the RGS-1, which is showing you that the facial extension is definitely more than 1.5. Now let's look at the RGS-2, which is two millimeters. And there we have it. It's almost exactly two millimeters going towards the facial, your facial extension. Not your facial depth, but your facial extension. If we look at the RGS-4, which is four millimeters in length, we can see that the prep is about half of the buccal lingual dimension of the tooth. The RGS-4 is 1.5 millimeters in diameter, and so we can see that the axial depth in this particular case is less than 1.5, but with the RGS-3, which is one millimeter, we can see that it's more than one millimeter. So we're probably looking at it somewhere between 1.2 and 1.4 millimeters of axial depth. We can also use the RGS-2 length to determine the proper dimension incisal gingivally. If we look at the gingival clearance, you can see that it's a little bit less than an RGS-1. So it's about 0.3 millimeters of gingival clearance, and yet the incisal contact has remained intact. We haven't broken that. If we look at this from the facial view, you can see that it barely is visible from the facial, just a little sliver 
of the preparation is visible and it follows the contour of the adjacent tooth very nicely. So this is basically the preparation as it's completed. No need for a bevel, no need for retention grooves. Composite resin is going to do very well in this particular preparation design. So I think that if you follow the steps of using the 330 or the 329, followed by the 10614 enamel hatchet and a little bit of refinement with the burrs that we've indicated, the 329 or the 330, almost in a slow speed manner, I think you'll be able to make a preparation that meets the criteria of the clinical situation or any dental school that may be looking at testing your ability to perform a class three prep. If you have any comments or questions, please let me know. Always trying to improve things to make dentistry better for all of us. Thanks again. Go back to my slideshow. Okay, so let's talk about class three preparation. Okay, so let's talk about the ideal class three preparation. So we're gonna first talk about the outline form. All right, this is gonna start. Let's see, a bit. Okay, here we go. All right, it's working now. So let's talk about the outline form. So mostly we're gonna start the preparation on the lingual and it's going to be rectangular with rounded corners. Interproximally, the facial contour, facial will follow the tooth contour, uh, incisal and gingival walls parallel to each other. So it's rectangular, the uh, corners are all rounded and uh, it's going to follow the tooth contour and the two walls, the incisal and the gingival walls are going to be parallel to each other. The extensions facially, it's going to be 0.0 to 0.5 millimeters. So very, some cases you will be able to see it, some cases, you might not be able to see the, the pression. Gingively, it's going to be 0.5 millimeter, as uh, Dr. Stevenson talked about, that it, the caries happens below the contact area, so we involve the gingival area as well as the contact area. So the, the prep is going to go gingively, 0.5 millimeters, and incisal, incisal, incisally, we're gonna be zero millimeters because if it goes in the incisal and we involve it, it's gonna be a class three, uh, a class four preparation. So um, uh, this is how it's uh, going to look. It's rectangular, it's rounded angles. The incisal and gingival walls are parallel to each other and uh, uh, it is um, going to follow the tooth contours. Now, uh, the gingival clearance from adjacent tooth is 0.5 millimeter, and the depth axially is 1.5 to 2 millimeter in size of gingivally. Now, bevel, let's talk about the bevel a little bit. So, as Dr. Stevenson said, there is no need for bevel. So it is a controversial issue where some doctors don't put a bevel and some do. If you do 
put a bevel, which I do put a bevel, it is going to be only 0.5 millimeter bevel on all the margins which you can see. So um, it is a very a small bevel which you are going to place. Uh, the resistance form, the walls are 90 degree. Uh, walls form 90 degree angle with cable surface. So there is no acute angles. You want to make sure it's either obtuse or it's 90 degree angles. Yeah. Enamel at incisal edge is always supported by dentine. So if it is not, then you change it into a class four cavity. There is rounded internal angles and the axial wall is 0.5 millimeter into dentine and it may be concave. So in this case, if you look at the uh, picture, the, you can see a lot of the wall because it's concave. And it, it, if it is more than 0.5 millimeter into dentine, you need to put a base, uh, not a base, sorry, a liner. So try not to put any base. There is no need for base. Just put a liner like a vitrobond in there. Now the retention. Most of the retention is through bonding. Uh, Micromechanical retention is from bonding. The bevel, enamel bevel, it's in retention. It extends the surface area of enamel bonding. So since we're putting the bevel on the enamel, so our surface area of enamel is increased. And since our surface area of enamel is increased, now you guys know that the when we uh, the most of the bonding is in enamel there's hardly any bonding which happens in dentine so the bevel the the logic of bevel is that we need to increase the bonding and that is why we're placing the bevel so uh, enamel bevel is in retention um, and bonding is what causes the retention. And that's why the prep is most, mostly just whatever the caries is. Wherever the caries is, you remove the caries, you bevel the, uh, the area, and then you start. And not to have any acute angles, just make 90 degree angles, clean, clean prep, rounded prep, uh, rounded, right ang uh, rounded angles, and then you're ready to fill it. Pretty simple. Now, the, the margins, the walls have to be smooth. Uh, the bevel has to be uh, in aesthetic area. It does have to be in aesthetic area because bevel, what happens with bevel is it helps to blend the composite. So it doesn't show um, like a, a separate thing. That, that is the reason that we also want to pay, place bevel in an aesthetic area. You do not want to extend an area which is in contact for the sole purpose of placing a bevel. So just bevel where, where the prep is. Uh, that's the whole, you don't need to extend the prep to just place bevel. Bevel measures 0.5 to 1 millimeter wide and it's optional on the lingual. Uh, wider for class three, uh, I mean, sorry, for class four. Class four uh, cavities, the uh, bevel is, uh, is thicker and um, you cover a lot more area for the bevel because of the aesthetic reasons. Now, um, before you start a class three or a class four cavity, you do rubber dam. You wanna make sure that it, um, is uh, there's no leaks, it's inverted, it's centered on the face, it's properly placed. Um, then when you are doing the prep, you don't want to damage the adjacent tooth. When you're filling, you don't want to damage the adjacent tooth. Uh, so you have to be very careful with the adjacent tooth. And that is the reason hatchet is a great idea to use uh, for uh, the prep of the tooth. Uh, during the preparation because that little ledge which uh, we have left, if you remove with hatchet, there is no chance that you would damage the adjacent tooth. Uh, again, the soft tissues, the gingiva and all have to be protected. They, you need, cannot damage uh, all those. Uh, 
now purple protection so when um you have prepared the tooth now when you are going axially if you are deeper than one millimeter in dentine you need to cover the dentine so don't you don't need to put a base uh just put a thin layer over the deepest area like a vitro bond or some glass isomer over there i normally just place vitro bond on the deepest area uh, on the dentine and uh, i'm good to go and i'm ready to etch so just uh, do that so you want to follow the contours the tooth um has to uh, uh the the contours have to follow the tooth and uh, everything the uh, embrasure space everything has to be appropriate when uh, you are doing the prep the restoration margins uh they need to flush with the tooth and there should not be any voids or excess um i am going all right so um now let's talk about the restoration finish function and damage uh so um the restoration needs to be uh nicely polished it should not look shabby it should not have any voids uh the contact should be established occlusion should be appropriate and there should be no hard or soft tissue damage um how do you uh fix a um, a void which happens in a composite so this is the beauty of about composite uh if there is a void all you have to do is drill the void out etch it uh then prime and bond put the composite cure finish and polish and it looks pretty good so um uh, and i do it few times it does happen and uh, you just patch it up and it looks pretty good patient cannot even make out so um now class 3 restoration this one has a facial view to it um again it's rectangular rounded angles uh it's uh, there is uh, you know either uh, obtuse angle or 90 degree no acute angles um uh, and then we are going to do the uh, the filling of the class 3 uh, restoration so make sure you place the rubber dam and it's nicely placed um and then we are going to uh, place uh, the mylar and the wedge and uh, do the uh, filling so uh, we're going to talk about how to do the class 3 restoration and i'm going to first let you guys watch a video of uh richard stevenson he has put it all together pretty well and after that i'm going to go over uh, everything uh with you guys so i'm going to play the video right now and uh, right here is the video Hi everybody. I'm Dr. Richard Stevenson and I'm the director of Stevenson Dental Solutions in San Dimas, California. I'm also an emeritus professor of clinical dentistry at UCLA and I have a private practice in West Los Angeles. And today we're going to tackle the class 3 composite restoration in the previous video where we did the preparation on tooth number 9 DL. So let's start by inserting the plastic mylar strip which is about 50 microns thick. This is thicker than a metal matrix band. So sometimes you need to just create a little bit of separation by tweaking an instrument between the teeth and allowing the strip to seat 
all the way through the contact down to the gingival crest. And because this matrix strip is rather thick, being 50 microns, if you are not going to place a wedge, you may end up having a problem with reestablishing a contact. So I'm going to go ahead and use a Garrison soft wedge. This is the extra small size. You can use a wooden wedge of a different style if you like. And just insert this between the teeth to compensate for the thickness of that band. It should be secure and it shouldn't pull out easily. In other words, the wedge has to trap the band against the tooth. We're going to be wrapping the plastic mylar matrix strip across the facial and then across the lingual to establish the bulk of the contours. There are many ways of doing this, but I like this particular method for this particular uh, examination. I'm just going to use adhesive. There's no need to etch. There's no need to use any primer. This is just a straight adhesive made by Kerr called Optibon. So guys, he is not etching or priming because it's a type of tooth, but uh, clinically we always etch and prime uh, the tooth. So I just don't want you guys con getting confused and thinking what's going on. So, um, but this time he's just uh, using the bond directly. FL. You could use a universal adhesive or whatever adhesive you, you have available. Now, it's important not to like hear this. We want this to be soft. So when we insert the composite, and this time I'm using Filtex Supreme Ultra A2 body, not. So wanted to tell you guys, we're gonna go over all etching, bonding, different things, uh, we, uh, different uh, techniques we're gonna follow to do it uh, when I do the presentation. So don't worry about that part at this time. Not the enamel, not the dentin. It, it creates sort of this snowplow effect. In other words, when you inject the composite, it squishes the adhesive out of the preparation and it allows better adaptation of the composite. And then we're gonna manipulate the contours before we like here with an IPC. And if the uh, composite is sticking to the instrument, you can always use a product called Modeling Resin by Bisco. Other companies make a similar product, and what these do is they, they allow the instrument to manipulate the composite without sticking to the composite, and they don't in any way diminish the hardness or the quality of the composite surface. And look how well this composite will flow into the plastic matrix area by utilizing the technique of a snowplow where you're injecting and allowing the adhesive to flow out rather than pre-curing the adhesive. Uh, it's a magical uh, thing to see. And you can see how incredible this is. Now, of course, there's lots of flash to clean up but that is uh, not a big deal if you understand how to remove the flash without the use of burrs. Never put a rotary diamond or carbide on this tooth, ever. You have to remember these teeth are fairly soft. They're brittle, but they're fairly soft and they'll make little marks uh, with the burrs. So use a blade like a 12 scalpel and just use a tip. Don't use the whole side of it. Just use the tip and angle the, the blade at uh, probably 30 or 45 degrees towards the tooth so that you're not scraping up along it, but you're actually turning the instrument into, right like this. You see, I'm turning the instrument into the tooth as I remove the flash. You could use a finishing strip if you like, whatever it takes to remove the flash and approximately, and now we're ready to go with polishing and contouring at the same time because we have flash. So these are the die comp uh, set, the die comp instruments. The step one is a green and the step two is a gray. Each one of these has a two-step uh, process. Probably want to use these with water. I'm not going to show you how to use them dry today, but a little bit of water is going to decrease the heat. 
And then these are the feather lights by Brassler, and, and these are the final touch to give you an incredible high luster when you're finished with the contouring. If for some reason you happen to have a lot of excess composite uh, in this area and you need to do some contouring, you can use the OptiDisc by Kerr with this little mandrel. It's a latch type mandrel and you go from the left to the right. They have a couple different sizes uh, available, 12 millimeters, 9 millimeters approximately. And they go from dark to light. And I don't think you're going to need to use uh, these, on, uh, all of these on this particular composite. You can just use the last two because you just need a little minimal amount of contouring to the, the restoration. You can see here that I've got the grit facing towards the handpiece and I'm just using it to kind of flip over, flipping like that, which will create a nice little embrasure on the lingual side. Now I have the grit facing out and I'm doing the same thing, once again flipping the instrument and going out this direction. If you can, uh, add a little water to decrease the heat and remove some of the composite dust as you're progressing through this procedure. So now that we've got the basic shape to the marginal ridge, let's focus on removing flash and putting a high luster. This is the diacomp point, and this is a two-step process, first with the green and then with the gray. I like to use all the greens first and then go back over with the grays. So notice how the cup adapts so well to the natural fossa and just replicate that same morphology on your, on your composite tooth. And even if this uh, ends up hitting some of the tooth structure, it's not going to leave uh, an, a nasty mark that could potentially cause you to lose points. Once again, never use an egg-shaped diamond, an egg-shaped carbide ever on this particular restoration. And this is the diacomp disc. Works similar to the cup, it's just a little faster. Now we don't want to flatten out the marginal ridge. When you're using this, make sure you keep it away from the height of the contour of the marginal ridge. It's nice to have one of these blades because they can remove flash that happen to wrap around on the facial. Then finally, we're going to use the, uh, the feather lights. First the green and then the gray. And this entire procedure takes no more than about uh, 30 minutes and you can end up having a pretty good result when you're finished. And here we have the final result. Uh, like I said, it didn't take very long to accomplish and I think that this would uh, keep uh, your examiners pretty happy. You can look at this from the facial and make sure that you don't have any flash in that area. You will see just a little bit of the composite and uh, that's it. So I hope you enjoyed this uh, two-part video series on the class 3 composite, Querimos Magisterium. Take care. All right, let's... Hi, this is Robert Kiyosaki and I want to talk to you about an opportunity to learn to be an entrepreneur on the internet. And let me tell you something, as an old guy, you're the luckiest guy on earth. Sorry, guys, sorry, sorry, sorry. I will have to. And now I am back in chess. All right. So uh, let's talk about the restoration. So we got the rubber dam placed, and we got the miler and the wedge placed. Uh, like uh, Dr. Stevenson was saying, sometimes we have a hard time getting the mylar in. So you just use any instrument, push the other tooth a little bit to the side so we can create a little space and so we can place the mylar strip. Now you have to be very careful when you're pushing the other tooth in patient's mouth because there is gum. And remember the gum, if it bleeds, once it started bleeding, it's really, really hard to do a good composite filling. So you have to be very careful. Examine the gums before you're going to do a composite. Few times, what I have done is I have done a cleaning uh, of the patient. Even he wanted a filling first uh, before I had to do a filling and let the gums heal because I knew if uh, the gums were gonna be that red and inflamed, 
this case was not going to be a good case for me. So, you know, go with your clinical judgment, check the gums. Gums are very, very critical for a good composite filling. If there is bleeding, your composite is not going to last long. So be careful with that. So once you place the mylar strip, um, uh, and the wedge and then with the wedge you know you have to kind of play around with different sizes i really like the garrison uh, wedges they're like kind of soft and they kind of go in pretty good uh, so just you know you'll um, see the space and then uh, try small and then going uh, larger one by one so uh, now we're going to use the H, the phosphoric acid, uh, 15 seconds. Uh, so the main thing about H is you have to keep in mind that when we are etching, remember the H is mainly for the enamel. So um, there, uh, there is um, one thought in which they say that when you're putting the H, try to put the H first on the enamel and then go in the dentine. So uh, that way the um, etch is very less time on the dentine and stays longer on the enamel because enamel is where the bonding is going to really happen. And that's how our composite is gonna stay. So uh, just etch the tooth with your phosphoric acid. Then we wash it off and uh, and then um, wash it off nicely with water and then you air dry it now i want to talk a little bit about uh, the uh, etching now previously you know our assistants or we were taught that uh, you know air dry it like nice and air dry and it should be white and chalky mm. nowadays the latest thing is that when we um, remove the edge, the the surface should not be white and chalky and the enamel should not be chalky because then there is more ch chances of sensitivity. So now they are saying that it has to be a little glossy and uh, like not wet, wet, but little wet, very tiny wet, like kind of like it has to not, uh, be uh, uh, dehydrated. So, um, so just when you dry, don't over dry um, after etching. Uh, after um, you uh, etch the tooth and you remove uh, the etch. So, in uh, then you scrub it with a primer and bond. Now, there are so many primers and bonding systems. Um, we used to, I used to first do the one where was there, the, I used to apply the primer first and then uh, air dry the primer and then apply the bond. That system was amazing. I loved it. It worked really good. But now I really like VOCO. VOCO is like one system where, you know, I press a button, the primer gets dispensed in the bond. And then I just mix it up and I apply it. And then we air dry it. Very slow air drying of the tooth. And then we light cure it. So remember, this is air, air thin primer bond. Very slowly you air thin it. And then you light cure it for 10 seconds. And then we start placing composite. Now with composite, I've gone to various seminars and different people teach different things. So some people teach that you place a layer of flowable on the bottom layer and then you start adding composite on top. I have been doing that. It works great for me. Uh, cases have been successful. I, what I would recommend to all of you guys is talk to your doctor. What does he like? And then try and experiment different things for yourself. You will find what works for you. So um, try to do that. And then you place the composite in increments. You don't want to place too much at a time. Uh, and then, uh, you know, with the mylar strip, you kind of shape it around. I do use a layer, uh, I do use bond 
and I kind of the bond kind of helps me to smoothen it a little bit and it it works great um there was um i did talk to the uh, developers of composite they came to a clinic and i talked to them that applying this layer of bond on top does it compromise with the composite strength and they said it's okay i mean till it's like a very thin layer and just kind of helps you make this composite smooth and nice it's totally fine so uh then you use a mylar strip to help uh, you contour the composite and don't pull too tightly. Um, and you wanna get a, a good proximal contact. Then you cure it. Right there. The composite right there. All right. So now you can use, this is a finishing strip. You can use a surgical blade, uh, number 12. Um, that works great too. Uh, the strip works great too. Um, just uh, make sure you do have a contact. Um, and that is the reason you have to place the wedge because uh, if you don't place a wedge, uh, then sometimes you do not get a good contact. Um, and then you continue kind of uh, going further and making sure you have a good contact. And that is it. And then we are going to talk about um, some tips for completing uh, class four restorations. Class four restorations are a little bit trickier because the shade uh, has to be very carefully picked. You have to show it to the patient, make sure they are happy with it. And also you have to set up correct expectations. So what I do is I always underestimate myself and tell the patient that I'm going to try my best, but it might not uh, match 100% with your existing teeth and all that. And then when the outcome is better than what I told them, they are very happy. So um, that's uh, one thing I do. Then uh, you have to tell them that they cannot chew very hard things. This is more for aesthetics you know, the class four, and you uh, want to duplicate the anatomy just like the um, um, contralateral tooth. So if you're doing number eight, you want it to look like nine. Um, so you want to overfill it and then, um, you know, shape it and contour it. And then you want to adjust the occlusion in the end. Occlusion is the key. You got to do it. Otherwise, your composite will break if it's high. So make sure you do that. Now the bevel uh, in class four, you class four, you remove the decay, and then the main thing is the full thickness bevel. The bevel is pretty thick; it's one point five to two millimeters long facial bevel, uh, and um, and then you can go modified full thickness bevel. Uh, so it's kind of like a wavy bevel. If you look at it, it's a little, or you can go starburst bevel, which makes it more aesthetic when you place uh, the uh, composite. So um, a bevel is really, really important in uh, a class four preparation. Uh, now, uh, sometimes in class four or even in class three, the decay could be deep. And here we are, we need to protect the pulp. So then you use dicyl or calcium hydroxide, and then please, please inform the patient it's deep. So if he starts having any problems, then he might need eventually a root canal, or later down the road, he might need a root canal. So um, here we are going to do um, a class for, um, uh, uh, a, comp a composite. And before I go over this slide, I am going to go back and show you a class four cavity uh, being filled by Dr. Stevenson. And he's done a great job and I liked it. 
So I wanted to show you guys, uh, it helps to kind of understand the procedure. So I'm gonna go back. Uh, All right, and Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Richard Stevenson and I'm the director of Stevenson Dental Solutions in San Dimas, California. And today we're gonna tackle the class four composite. This has gotta be one of dentistry's most challenging aesthetic situations. So let's get started. Got my iPad here and I'm going to show you what a class four prep would look like from the proximal view showing bevels both on the facial and lingual. And I'm going to draw in here a lingual segment of composite that we're going to fabricate utilizing a preoperative stent. This is going to be filled with a translucent composite material. The next area that we're gonna to wanna to build up when we're doing the class four is this middle section. And we're gonna have this middle section lay over the bevel just a little bit. That's important so that you can minimize the transition between one zone and another. And we're gonna do this in an A2 dentin. And it can be any dentin shade you want. Usually dentin shades are significantly more opaque than enamel shades and that's a great advantage for us. We're then going to lay on top of that an area of enamel and that'll fill in between the lobes that we lay down with the dentin. In this particular area will be either an A2 or an A1 dent, A1 enamel. We're going to utilize here an A1 enamel, at least that's our plan. And you notice that there's this little notch down at the incisal area and the reason for that is to create a little bit of a halo effect. This is an area on top that we're laying down which will be translucent. If all goes well, this should work quite well for us. So that's typically translucent. So you see that this is really a simplified version of a much more complicated design where we would use opaquers and stains and more maverick shades in the buildup of this class four. But I'm gonna keep it really simple today and I'm gonna see if we can pull this off with just a few shades of composite. So wish me luck. So what I did was I took some extracted teeth and I put them in my type it on and I simulated a fracture, a, a significant chip of a tooth, like a, an injury, some traumatic fracture of a tooth and we're going to use this as our starting point. So what I'm going to do first is utilize a 6888 burr, which is quite coarse. It's 125 micron grit. And we're going to lay over the fractured area, whatever that fractured area is, there's really no need to remove a lot of tooth structure because the injury kind of did it for you. But we're going to create a bevel that is going to be at a very minimum, the thickness of the enamel and more than a millimeter wide, probably more like a millimeter and a half, maybe two millimeters wide or even wider. So if you make this really long bevel kind of going across that facial, you can really hide the composite and not have that horrible white line that we sometimes see or too much of an obvious transition. I'm now gonna starburst this. It's a, it's a way to sort of put an irregular bevel on top of the bevel and it's gonna look like a star burst. And you're gonna shoot this across the tooth just a little bit, and this will help out with the transition. Now, before I started, I went ahead and made a, a stent, and this would be normally made off of a diagnostic wax up of your class four fracture. If you have time, you can quickly pour it up and do a quick wax up or have a laboratory help you with this, but I went ahead and made one and I utilize a very accurate material so that it fits intimately. I think a lot of people make these a little bit too quickly with not a lot of concern for accuracy. It's really important. The more accurate you are, the better your morphology will be on the lingual. 
So today we're going to use Harmonize by Kerr, and it's really kind of a simple system. They they just have these enamel shades, indention shades, and then they have a, a translucent shade. I am going to challenge myself to not use 12 or 15 different shades of composite and tints and opaquers because for a lot of people that's just not practical. These are the PTFT tapes or the Teflon tapes that we're used to using. So I, I am going to talk about these Teflon tapes and they work really good. I do use them. Um, so whenever the two teeth are not in contact, uh, the mylar strip is not going to stay in place. And so what I do is I use the Teflon tape and I place it on the adjacent tooth um, uh, at the proximal surface. So suppose I'm doing the mesial of tooth number um, nine, then on the distal of tooth number eight, I'm going to place the Teflon tape around it. And that way, when I do etch or anything, it's not going to go on that tooth and it works really good. So watch it. This. this one here is your typical. It's very thin, but the problem with this tape is it crinkles over on itself quite a bit. And it gets a little bit messy and can kind of stick into your composite if you're leaving this in place while you're placing your composite. A thicker tape is the gas line tape. Now you can pick this up in the same section of the store, or maybe you'd have to go to the section where they have the plumbing for gas lines and find this thicker tape. And what I really like about this particular tape, instead of the white tape, which is used for water lines, is that you can crinkle this up and it still lays out really flat for you. So it's, it's quite thin and it can be stretched quite a bit, but it's less likely to crumple over on, your, on itself. So take a look here, I can kind of rub on it and it maintains its shape. Now for utilizing the typical Teflon paper water lines and you rub on it, you see how it kind of folds over on itself and it can be a real mess. So I like using that particular uh, yellow tape. Let's test the shades. I don't always do this because you know, once the rubber dam's on, the tooth is drying out, so it becomes a little bit irrelevant uh, what shade you're going to choose based on trying it, trying it this way. It's usually just better just to pick your shade and go, go with what you see uh, and not worry about the fact that the tooth is dehydrating. So we can just take a look at this, cure it on the tooth, and get an idea what it's going to look like. Because remember that hybrid composites when you cure them are always going to shift in their value. They're never going to be the same value they were coming out of the tube. So when you lay it down, you can kind of get this idea that, uh oh, this is the wrong shade. And then after you light cure it, you find a completely different situation. And you can see that shade change before and after curing. It's really obvious. I'm also going to go ahead and try a translucent on here just to see how that looks. Translucents, uh, it seems like they would be the most wonderful things you could use, but a lot of times translucents are going to create a lot of graying of the composites. You have to be really careful about how you use translucents. We are going to use a translucent on the lingual simply because I like the translucent on the lingual because you're going to have translucent interproximal, and if you used opaque, you would not have any flexibility there. So here we are just uh, putting acid etch over everything. We really like to extend the composite way beyond the bevel so that if there's any flash of composite, we're not gonna have any white lines. This is our, we're gonna use our adhesive. So I want you guys to see how he has put the Teflon tape or the gas line tape on the Justin tooth, and kind of separated it and then how he etched the kind of mostly all of the tooth because of the bevel he had placed. So that's uh, one thing in class four to keep in mind. Adhesive system, I just happen to be using a one-step adhesive system, basically a universal system. And we're gonna blow that thin. Boy, look at all the texture on that tooth. Isn't that amazing? We're gonna blow it thin, we're gonna do our light curing, we're gonna light cure from the facial, light cure from the lingual as we always do, and then we're gonna take this little jig we have, this preoperative stent, we're gonna fill it with our translucent and adapt it really well, 
and we're going to thin it out. So it's really critical that we keep this nice and thin so that we don't have to modify it once we attach it to tooth structure. I like to place it in the jig and then attach it to the tooth. I'd rather do it this way than put material on the tooth and try to smash the jig into it or try to place the jig on the tooth and then place the composite into that little crack there, I typically get voids. But by placing the composite material in the jig first and carrying that onto the tooth, it's amazing how well it adapts. It's really kind of just incredible how much better this is than having the jig in place and trying to pack the composite in there where you end up getting a void on the lingual side so much of the time. So you see why we're using translucent so that we have translucent incisal and we also have translucent interproximal because we can always make something opaque but we can never take something opaque and make it translucent so it's always good to use translucent on your lingual. All right. So now this is in place and you can see how nicely it replicated that lingual anatomy. Boy, that would have been really hard to do freehand. All right, so here we are utilizing a, a dentin shade. This is your A2 a dentin. And I'm gonna sculpt this a little bit so that it, it has more than just a single dimension to it. I wanna create these sort of lobes underneath the surface. And, um, and remember that when you place this, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that it's under contoured significantly so that you can add subsequent layers above it. So just kind of tuck it in a little bit, make it like this little corner there that's below the outer contour of the tooth and in, you know, spend enough time to wipe off the excess. Keep the light, the operatory light away from the field so that you have extended amount of time. If you're wearing loops with lights on them, make sure you're using the orange filter over the front of it so that you can have a little bit more time to play with this. And once you create sort of this, you know, variable morphology, this internal structure, then you can go ahead and cure that. And I usually try to cure from lingual site first, then follow up from the facial. So now we have this substructure now that's under contoured significantly, and now we're gonna to add to this with presumably we're gonna use our enamel shade. So we're gonna lay down this an A1 enamel. And this is, like I said, this is a very simplified approach. And you notice I'm not using any Teflon tape. I'm just gonna place the uh, composite right up against the adjacent tooth, which has not been etched, which has not been treated with any bonding material. So we'll be able to just make a little kind of a cracking move with a little bit of an instrument to separate those two and get a strip between there very easily. And here's this little in, in, in this indentation, this little channel, and maybe we're gonna create some little, uh, little variable sort of depressions that create this effect of maybe um, a translucency on the incisal. So uh, I'm doing this with just a few shades of composite, so I, I'm, my expectations are not very high, but I'm doing uh, as much as I, uh, I can with the materials that we're using. So now we've got the enamel in place, so now it's, it's ready for translucent, you would think. Now the problem today was that the translucent was just too translucent, or maybe what I could say is that the enamel shade underneath was very translucent and very translucent means very gray. And I think that we get so concerned about using translucent shades when in fact the real issue is the lack of opacity. So I'm aborting this. I am not gonna use that. I'm gonna go to a dentin shade. You can pick up an opaque composite. A lot of companies have opaque shades and I think that uh, they can rescue situations like this where you're midway through and you're you're thinking, oh my goodness, this is not turning out well. So uh, I want you to remember that it's opacity that is your friend and not translucency. Translucency is really a necessary aspect of composites, but it is very challenging to just use translucent composite materials and make a realistic looking class four restoration. Remember, translucents allow the light through. When they allow the light through, the darkness of the oral cavity shines through the front of that composite and everybody sees that you've got this gray composite. So I would much rather have this opacity. I also noticed this in class five composites. When we try to use translucents thinking that we're gonna create this lifelike appearance, we end up kind of looking at this gray composite and wondering, what did I do wrong? And I think it's just a matter of understanding that it's the, the, the opacity that is going to really give you 
what you want in most of these situations. So um, I boarded that and I switched over to this opaque, more opaque composite. And you can look at it from the incisal view. I think this is gonna be the, the reality check view for all of us on class fours is this, this incisal view because that's where you can really determine if your line angles on that mesial are correct or not. Yes, we can get our length from the facial and we can get our overall basic contours and texture and things like that, but getting that, that mesial facial line angle correct really requires us to look at this from the occlusal view. Look at that incisal view. Uh, I don't mind utilizing a little micro brush to smooth things out. I also use um, camel hair brushes and uh, uh, even sometimes rubber tips and things like that to manipulate the composite. Today I'm just showing you a very simple approach. I think that this is acceptable. It's not... Okay, so we're going to talk about class four uh, restorations, the filling. Um, so once we have prepped the tooth, we have done the bevel, everything is set. If it is deep, we put dical or we put vitrobon, depending upon how deep it is. So if it's really deep and it's close to the pulp, we'll have to put some dical. But if it's just a little bit deep, um, you know, um, beyond uh, dentine, um, uh, then we put uh, a little bit of vitrobon and then we are ready to etch the tooth. So you put the phosphoric acid, um, 15 seconds etch. Now in this case, as it was shown on the video, you're gonna etch most of the tooth because remember the bevel is kind of extended uh, on the, uh, the, the facial surface of the tooth. So you etch the tooth nicely and then you wash it off, rinse it, uh, air dry it, but you don't want to dehydrate the tooth. So make sure you don't dehydrate it and then you use the prime and bond. Now prime and bond is very much what system you guys are using in your office. Uh, you can pick either a two system uh, one where you use the prime first, air it and use the bond or you can use nowadays like the one system uh, where you it's all in one and you apply. But remember when you are applying this prime and bond, the main thing is that you need to spend some time, you know, letting the prime and bond kind of get in the tooth. It's not like touch and go. So you guys need to like kind of with a micro brush, uh, rub it onto the, the tooth so it gets inside it. And then you air it, um, uh, slow air, you know, and then we start applying composite. So um, in this case, um, so, um, so now you start applying composite to the lingual half. Now, um, like he talked about, you can use different shades. Um, you can use uh, the transparent shade first, and then you use the dentine shade and the enamel shades. And, uh, you know, go, this is something you will learn clinically as time goes by, uh, what shade to apply when and how much. And you have to look at the adjacent tooth, how it's looking the shades and everything, and the patient's acceptance. Uh, uh, you know, what he would like more. Um, so um, uh, I normally mix two to three, kind of put, uh, you know, some dentine and some enamel shades. I'll be honest, I don't use too much of the transparent shade. But I use it on the incisal edge. Uh, but, uh, you know, sometimes it makes it too transparent and it just um, shows too much through. So you have to be careful when you're using that. Um, in transparent shades, there are two kinds which come. There is one dark and one light. So in few cases, I've used the dark one, which I like more than the light one. The light one, I feel, is too light. 
and um, sometimes that just doesn't work that good with me and then you apply the uh, most of the time you need uh, the uh, Teflon tape or something because uh, the mylar strip might not stay in. If the mylar strip stays in, put the mylar strip, put the wedge, go ahead, start proceeding with putting uh, composite layer by layer. Uh, a lot of times I don't use a flowable when I'm uh, doing this um, because, uh, you know, it depends. Uh, but a lot of times I don't need a flowable in this case. And then you start finishing um, the surface with the burrs, the flame burr, the interproximal burrs. You know, there's a football carbide, which works really good. So you start finishing with that. You remove the wedge and the strip. You use the finishing strips. You can use the disc, the cusp uh, to polish. And uh, you can also um, make some, uh, you know, according to the adjacent tooth, you can uh, make some, uh, uh, you know, kind of like a natural looking tooth. So if there is something which you see in particular, you can kind of add it to the, um, to the tooth which was uh, broken. So, um, and then you want to make sure the contact is there, the floss is going through, everything is good. And show the mirror to the patient. He's going to be happy. That makes your day. And then you can put a, a layer of raisin on a top. Now, I wanted to, I forgot to actually tell you guys that when I am applying composite layer by layer, I use the micro brush with the bond on it when I am applying it. And it works really good. You apply it. You leave that layer of bond and then you cure and then, you know, it just kind of makes it smooth and nice and really pretty. So um, I do use the micro brush with the bond. Um, that is uh, one of uh, my secrets. So um, that concludes our session of class three and class four cavities. Definitely, we are going to discuss uh, more about them on the Google Meet. And if you have any questions, please write them down uh, for me. Um, and uh, so we can talk more about them uh, during the Google Meet. Um, and I know that this is a hard time for all of you guys, uh, but I have full confidence that we all together can make it work. So all the best and I will see you guys for the pedo uh, uh, class now. Uh, all right, take care and that's about it. Have okay, so we're gonna talk about class four uh, restorations, the filling. Um, so once we have prepped the tooth, we have done the bevel, everything is set. If it is deep, we put dical or we put vitrobon, depending upon how deep it is. So if it's really deep and it's close to the pulp, we'll have to put some dical. But if it's just a little bit deep, um, you know, um, beyond a dentine, um, uh, then we put uh, a little bit of vitrobon and then we are ready to etch the tooth. So you put the phosphoric acid, um, 15 seconds etch. Now in this case, as it was shown on the video, you're going to etch most of the tooth because remember the bevel is kind of extended uh, on the, uh, the, the facial surface of the tooth. So you etch the tooth nicely and then you wash it off, rinse it, uh, air dry it, but you don't want to dehydrate the tooth. So make sure you don't dehydrate it and then you use the prime and bond. Now prime and bond is very much what system you guys are using in your office. Uh, you can pick either a two system uh, one where you use the prime first, air it, and use the bond, or you can use nowadays like the one system, 
uh, where you it's all in one and you apply. But remember, when you are applying this prime and bond, the main thing is that you need to spend some time, you know, letting the prime and bond kind of get in the tooth. It's not like touch and go. So you guys need to like kind of with a micro brush, uh, rub it onto the, the tooth so it gets inside it. And then you air it, um, uh, slow air, you know, and then we start applying composite. So um, in this case, um, so, um, so now you start applying composite to the lingual half. Now, um, like he talked about, you can use different shades. Um, you can use uh, the transparent shade first, and then you use the dentine shade and the enamel shades. And, uh, you know, go, this is something you will learn clinically as time goes by, uh, what shade to apply when and how much, and you have to look at the adjacent tooth, how it's looking, the shades and everything, and the patient's acceptance, uh, uh, you know, what he would like more. Um, so um, uh, I normally mix two to three, kind of put, uh, you know, some dentine and some enamel shades. I'll be honest, I don't use too much of the transparent shade. I use it on the incisal edge, uh, but, uh, you know, sometimes it makes it too transparent and it just um, shows too much through. So you have to be careful when you're using that. Um, in transparent shades, there are two kinds which come. There is one dark and one light. So in few cases, I've used the dark one, which I like more than the light one. The light one I feel is too light. And um, sometimes that just doesn't work that good with me. And then you apply the, uh, most of the time you need uh, the uh, Teflon tape or something because uh, the mylar strip might not stay in. If the mylar strip stays in, put the mylar strip, put the wedge, go ahead, start proceeding with putting uh, composite layer by layer. Uh, a lot of times I don't use a flowable when I'm uh, doing this um, because, uh, you know, it depends. Uh, but a lot of times I don't need a flowable in this case. And then you start finishing um, the surface with the burrs, the flame burr, the interproximal burrs. You know, there's a football carbide, which works really good. So you start finishing with that. You remove the wedge and the strip. You use the finishing strips. You can use the disc, the cusp uh, to polish. And uh, you can also um, make some, uh, you know, according to the adjacent tooth, you can uh, make some, uh, uh, you know, kind of like a natural looking tooth. So if there is something which you see in particular, you can kind of add it to the um, to the tooth which was uh, broken. So, um, and then you wanna make sure the contact is there, the floss is going through, everything is good. And show the mirror to the patient. He's gonna be happy. That makes your day. And then you can put a, a layer of raisin on a top. Now, I wanted to, I forgot to actually tell you guys that when I am applying composite layer by layer, I use the micro brush with the bond on it when I am applying it and it works really good. You apply it, you leave that layer of bond and then you cure and then, you know, it just kind of makes it smooth and nice and really pretty. So, um, I do use the micro brush with a bond. Um, that is uh, one of uh, my secrets. So um, that concludes our session of class three and class four cavities. 
definitely we are going to discuss uh, more about them on the Google Meet. And if you have any questions, please write them down uh, for me. Um, and uh, so we can talk more about them uh, during the Google Meet. Um, and I know that this is a hard time for all of you guys, uh, but I have full confidence that we all together can make it work. So all the best and I will see you guys for the pedo uh, uh, class now. Uh, all right, take care and that's about it. Have 